Welcome everyone to the Zoom launch of Stories of Nina Tukavut, an online digital story map that shares stories of place, history, and culture. The story map that we're sharing with you today was produced uh, and led by Nina Tukavut Community Council Research, Education, and Culture Department. We engaged Dr. Andrea Proctor on the content side and NCC member Tammy Lamborn on the technical side. She led the design um, of the digital story map. The story map is one of many tools that we will produce to share stories of history and culture while privileging and upholding our Inuit roots and traditions. We were very proud to launch the coloring book uh, last Friday uh, as part of our Nuna Tukabut Inuit education plan. This went over very well with youth across our territory. I'd also like to introduce you to our panelists that are joining us today. Uh, we have President Todd Russell, Vice President Jim Howell, the Research Education and Culture Team, Bryn Wood, Amy Badcock, and Melita Paul. And we have with us Dr. Andrea Proctor and Tammy Lamborn. I'd also like to thank our communications team who are here with us today as well, Kelly Broomfield and Mandy Poole. And before we get started, um, I'd like to invite President Russell to say a few words to open us on this really exciting launch today. Thank you, Amy. It, it is a real pleasure to be here uh, with all of you today. And Nakamik for all of those who are joining us uh, virtually and online. Uh, for the launch of our online story map. And it is an exciting part of the work that we're doing at Nuna uh, This This particular uh, initiative is called Stories of Nuna and we are so happy that we can share this with you, some aspects of our history, our culture in Nuna And the story of Nuna which is our ancient land, and our people is really a story of resilience, determination, and belonging. And like other Inuit and indigenous nations around the world, including right here in Labrador and in our province, our people have for generations lived through colonization. And as a people, we have continued to resist colonial policies, practices, and narratives that have often undermined who we are, our people, and they have tried to erase us, to say that we don't belong here, that we're not from here. And our commitment though, to resurgence and the preservation and the protection of our homeland and culture can be seen every day in our communities and in the ways we live with one another on our traditional lands. And you will see so much of that reflected in this particular presentation. I say to Nunatuvid in the wheat, we hope that this story map reconnects you and your family to your rich history and your culture. We hope that your stories and ways of life come alive through this story map and that you feel your culture and identity is respected, reflected, and affirmed. To all of those who are not a part of the Nunatuvid family, to our allies, our friends, other Inuit, indigenous nations and communities, and to non-indigenous peoples. If you take some time to scroll through this story map, we know that you will find yourself learning about our people and that you will recognize our people's deep connection and belonging to our ancestral homelands. This is a sacred connection. You will also see reflected some of our stories of belonging and connection to our Inuit homeland. You will learn how and why we still live on the lands and waters of our ancestors today. Our traditional places and our connections to these places are core to who we are and to how we continue to be in Nunatukavut. Our memories, your memories, our experiences, your experiences, these teachings and knowledge have been passed down from generation to generation. We hope that this story map helps to illustrate some of that story, some of those memories and teachings of life in Nunatuavut. So enjoy. It is a marvelous, marvelous presentation. Nakamik, 
And thank you to all of those who have been a part of making this happen today. We will now share the story map uh, with you and Dr. Andrea Proctor and I will walk you through some of the very exciting sections of, of the story map. And we certainly uh, implore you to uh, take a look after and check out our site. So the stories in this story map came from interviews and research done by NCC and them days. The photos were collected from both NCC members and from the Rome's Provincial Archive. Starting with a map tour, you'll learn about uh, the communities and um, uh, traditional places across our territory. Permanent settlement is uh, fairly recent in Southeast Labrador, and this concept of permanent settlement was actually introduced here and further influenced by foreign governments and laws set forth by colonial society. Prior to permanent settlement, family moves between bays, islands, headlands, and coves uh, with the seasons to hunt, harvest fish so that families can be taken care of. This map shows some of our traditional seasonal places and many of our people still maintain homes in these special places today. Thanks, Amy. When you think about shifting out, I was giving it some thought and it seems like a lifetime ago. And many of our kids today don't even have any uh, knowledge or even awareness of what um, shifting out or moving out means. And originally, when I think back to Charlottetown, people lived in the head of St. Michael's Bay or in Campbell's Cove before um, Charlottetown was settled in the early 50s. And they moved out to summer homes such as Triangle, Square Islands, Dead Islands, Hawks Harbor, uh, and many other coves and um, harbors along the coastline. For me, I guess I had the opportunity at a young age to do the shifting out, but not for very long before um, my father took a a position with Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro in the uh, 70s. So I missed doing this. Once that our family stopped doing this, I missed it and having to stay in the bay with very few people and a lot of flies, it was not always fun. But dad recognized the importance of land and place for us kids to being connected to our heritage. So he continued to immerse us in the traditions and activities such as the berry picking and navigating the land and where the salmon fishing and cod fishing would happen and where he would have navigated when he uh, grew up. And when I think of my home would be Triangle. That was where my family's summer home was located. And even though I didn't spend a line there as a child, um, but when I did go there, I felt a sense of belonging and a calmness and a peace that surrounded me. It was, um, I guess it was the land of my parents and my grandparents where they fished and lived upon. And then I later learned in my life um, how to express that feeling in words. Thanks to uh, Amy and some meetings that we attended, I learned what the meaning of blood connect and blood memory was. It was my link and my ties to triangle. And just this past Easter, I lost my dad. And that meant for me losing a piece of who I was and my connection to history, to the storytelling and his love for genealogy. So to reconnect to those roots and to those connections in honor of dad for Father's Day, I went to Triangle on the weekend, which as I said, is where I feel most at home. Took my husband and my sister and my grandchild and we went to visit and sat on the rocks where him and I would sit, look across the land where I would, him and I would berry pick, where we would sit salmon nets. I could see Cape Bluff in the background. And it was just like this piece. Um, my sister and I shared in the stories of times that we had visited, we shed some tears. Uh, and just, I guess, honoring him and his connection uh, to that land and passing that information on to us. And those memories that I can share and pass on to my children and grandchildren and um, just hope that that exchange of information continues for those place names and those important pieces of our history. And I feel, really feel that this story map will be an important part of sharing that story of those places. It's a great way to celebrate today being a National Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you, Melita, for that. That's a beautiful story. And we're so happy you had an opportunity to go to some of your traditional places over the weekend and celebrate your dad. So the next section is uh, place names and Inuit named places in their homeland, of course. 
Uh, and so this section shows some of the Inuktitut place names throughout Nunatuvut. One of the ways that uh, colonizers try to claim territory is to rename places in English or French. And so this map here shows um, or illustrates this process of colonization and these attempts to erase Inuit presence. And the map also shows the process of Inuit resurgence by reclaiming Inuktitut place names. Uh, the Inuktitut place names here were compiled in 1765 by Jens Haven, who was a Moravian missionary. Uh, he traveled to Labrador to ask Inuit about setting up a mission along the coast. Uh, and the Inuit that he met in Shadow Bay in southern Labrador suggested Kikitik, the spotted island black tickle area, um, because that was a central Inuit settlement. Now, 1765 was also the year of a significant event in Inuit history in Labrador. Um, after about 200 years of violence between Inuit and the European men who came to Labrador each summer uh, to exploit the rich marine resources, British officials met with about 300 Inuit at Chateau Bay to negotiate a peace treaty and the British promised to protect Inuit from harm and the Inuit promised to enter into friendship and, and to trade with the British. Uh, and the, the photo at the end of this section uh, is from 1891 and it shows an Inuit sod house or Ilusuak. Um, and this uh, picture is taken near the site of where this treaty took place. In the next section called Faces of Nunatukavut. In this section, you will see pictures of some of our elders, youth, and knowledge holders. Some of these people have passed on, but they still remain with us in the stories and knowledge that they have passed down to us. In this section, we honor those who have come before us and we celebrate our youth who are the future. Next, we have the National Park Reserve. Many of our people and their families have lived in and hunted along this area maintaining travel routes, traditional trap lines over many, many generations. Our, many of our families have sacred spaces and, and hold special memories connected to this land now known as the Mealy Mountain National Park. Next, we have land, waters, and ice. As Inuit, we have always lived on the lands, waters, and ice of our ancestors. Take a look and scroll through some of these beautiful photos of nature and animals and hear the stories of connection and belonging from our people. We really do have so much to be thankful for on our Inuit homeland. I grew up in, on the coast, uh, I guess back when uh, seals was a very important uh, um, um, diet. And not only diet, but this, you know, for, for uh, clothing and, and, and almost everyday use. Um, I, I'm going to leave you with a story or a tradition that uh, for, uh, from a young hunter, I guess, um, sort of growing up back then, there were no motors, there was only rowboats, and, uh, and the only uh, means of, of getting seals was rowing out to them and hunting them for ice in the springtime with the breakup. And I remember my, my older brother. Uh, being invited to go on a sea lump with my uncles and and they went out a beautiful day I can remember it and and, uh, and one of the traditions uh, when they, they actually harvested or hunted the seal or killed the seal was uh, to raise a flag on a boat when they were coming in either having the seal in the boat or towing it in this case it was a, it was a large seal they were towing it it was a seal that we uh, you know would call a square flipper uh, I guess the, uh, the scientific name would be a bearded seal. Uh, and with the tradition back then, um, your first kill or a hunt of a seal as a young boy was uh, when you got in, I mean, obviously there was a crowd of people and hunters from the harbor waiting for the boat to come in because they could see it coming with a flag up. So they go down and meet it and that young hunter was then asked to lie down on, on the barricaders or the snow and the seal itself would be all across his, his body. And you got to realize this seal, you know, you're looking at probably 10 to 12 feet long, uh, three or 400 pounds in weight. 
And once that was done, he uh, then had to take the, uh, the seal, skin it, and then ensure that every family in the community uh, received a piece of seal meat or, you know, or in every, every home, and, you know, ensure that they had the meal to seal. And, you know, there was nothing wasted um, back then. They, in this particular case, the seal, the seal had to be skinned in a little bit different way, like the, the normal up the belly kind of thing. It had to be skinned what they called a round. But like I said, I mean, every piece of seal was, was used. And going back, I mentioned crafts. Uh, one of the biggest things was making seal skin boots. Um, the old square fiber was the most common piece of, of skin they used for bottoms because it was tough and thick. And of course, then whatever was, was left was used for dog traces. And, you know, there, there was multi-purpose uses for, for the skin itself. Thank you, Jim, for sharing that with us. And these are just some of the stories that you'll, um, you'll be able to read um, and, and see some pictures um, through different times um, showing, you know, the, the different hunting, harvesting and fishing practices of, of our people and how families were really a big part of, um, of that work and of that, of that life. Next, we have dog teams. Dog teams were integral to our lives and to our survival, and, and largely so up until the 1960s and 70s. Dog teams were a big part of families, and they really ensured uh, a necessary means for families to travel for hunting and to also reconnect and connect with extended family and kinship networks between seasonal homes. Um, take a look through some of our pictures, um, listen to some of our videos, and uh, hear some of the stories about the important relationship between Inuit and dog teams in Nunatakalut. The final two sections in this site um, describe two important parts of Nunatuavut history. And the first is the devastation of the Spanish flu in 1918. Uh, which killed about a fifth of the population in Sandwich Bay. So you can scroll through this section uh, to read firsthand accounts of the survivors of this epidemic, um, which of course has become very real again today as we're, we're trying to cope with uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic. And the last section uh, provides some background information and stories about three residential schools in Nunatuavut, where hundreds of, of children lived between 1920 and 1964. So the first was the Labrador Public School at Muddy Bay, which opened in 1920, uh, and which took in many of the children who had lost parents in the Spanish flu epidemic. When that boarding school burned down in 1928, the International Grenfell Association rebuilt it near Cartwright and called it the Lockwood School. The third residential school uh, was established in 1931 at Mary's Harbor and it closed in 1938. And then later on in 1964, the Lockwood School closed. So you can explore this section and read stories told by former students about their experiences in the boarding schools and what it felt like to have to leave their homes and, and live in these institutions. Um, the residential schools were designed to separate children from the influence of their families and, and their communities. And uh, the impact was, was often uh, quite, quite devastating and caused lifelong and, and multi-generational harm closes the launch of our story map. Uh, Nakumik and, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, here today and please do check out our story map at www.nunatuhavut.ca.